Lord be with you. It is a joy to see you as we gather together to worship. We are delighted to have you with us this morning. If you are a guest with us, we are especially blessed to have you here. It is our hope that this time of worship is refreshing for your spirit and draws you closer to Christ our Lord. Uh, it's our practice as a congregation as we begin worship that we say our mission statement together. It's what grounds everything that we do. It's our way of stating uh, the great commandment and the great commission. And so congregation, I invite you to join me. We are a people committed to following Jesus, growing together, and sharing God's love with neighbors near and far. I invite you to take a moment to consider uh, the, the state of mind, the, the state of your heart as you gather together to worship. Maybe you've had a nice leisurely morning and you've had a couple cups of coffee, you've arrived, you're settled. Maybe it's been very frantic and you're just thinking, okay, I made it. All right, whatever it is, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, we are an intergenerational family of faith and we are delighted to have the kids who are with us Parents, please know that we welcome the wiggles and giggles from your children. We do not expect them to be uh, miniature adults, and we are delighted to have them with us. A little later in the service, there will be an opportunity uh, for the children, if you would like parents, for them to go out to the playground to stretch a little bit, to play, uh, to make some friends out there, and I will let you know when that time comes. There are a couple of things that I want to make sure you are aware of. Uh, first, next Sunday is Youth Sunday, so uh, that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful morning of worship, so uh, mark your calendars and look forward to that. It is always great to uh, be led in worship by our youth, and also please be praying for them as they continue to prepare. Uh, Jared is away from us this morning. He is at a friend's wedding. And so um, we are delighted and very grateful that Dave Dorman is going to be singing for us this morning and leading us in the worship through our song. And so Dave, thank you very much for that. Uh, if you look in your bulletin, you will notice a three by five card or four by six or I don't know, some size card. All right, one of those. All right, so everybody do me a favor, take that out and hold it up. Okay, so. I have a particular request with that card, and here's what it is. You know, we've been through a lot. This has been a difficult year and a half, and over uh, the next year or so, we're looking at what it means uh, to ground ourselves in hope. I see this next year as a year of hope uh, and renewal, a season of hope and renewal, and one of the ways that I want to invite us into that hopeful reflection is by remembering the ways that we have seen God, uh, God's faithfulness in the past. You know, remembering is a Christian discipline. You think about all the different things about the Christian life that are rooted in remembering and, and allowing the, the remembering that we do to uh, root us and, and ground us and grow us. So here's my request with that card. I would like to know, so put your name at the top of it or on the back or somewhere on the card, I would like to know what is a Bible story or a biblical verse that has been particularly meaningful to you at some point in your past. All right, makes sense? Is that simple enough? All right, so take the card, write your name on it so I know who to talk to as I look at these. And what we're going to be doing um, is for a period of time, I don't know how long yet, I'm going to be preaching off of some of these stories, some of these verses, and so I really encourage you to take the time to consider. It doesn't have to be your favorite, but just what is a verse or a story that, that God has used to ground you in your life uh, to be faithful to you at some point in the past. So take some time, fill that out. Uh, when we get to the end of the service, I will let you know what to do with that card, okay? Any questions on that? All right, very good. A little later in the service, you will have a chance to hear from uh, the Laird Hall Task Force. Uh, as you came in, you saw some of the early uh, uh, signs of uh, the information they want to share with you, and so you'll get to hear more from them a little later in the service. Friends, at this time, I want to invite all of us to 
settle ourselves in the presence of the God in whom we live and move and have our being. So I invite you now to take a moment of silence and to settle yourself in the spirit who meets us here. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. Here may the faithful find salvation and the careless be awakened. Here may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here may the tempted find help and the sorrowful find comfort. Here may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Here may the aged find consolation and the young be inspired. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. And I invite you to stand as you are able for our call to worship. The earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it, the world and its inhabitants too. Because God is the one who established it on the seas, God set firmly on the waters. Praise the Lord. Please hum as you follow along with the hymn. And now let us confess the faith in which we were baptized by saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Mark, and we are in chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Again, that is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. If you have your Bible with you or you're using an app, I encourage you to bring the reading up so that you can follow along. Uh, But before we read our scripture lesson, will you please join me in prayer? Lord God, help us to turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak. For you speak peace to your people through Christ our Lord. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Again, we're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. I invite you to listen now to the word of the Lord and for God's word to you today. Jesus left that place and went into the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know that he had entered a house, but he couldn't hide. In fact, The woman whose young daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard about him right away. She came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, Syrophoenician by birth. She begged Jesus to throw the demon out of her daughter. He responded, the children have to be fed first. It isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But she answered, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Good answer, he said. Go on home. The demon has already left your daughter. When she returned to her house, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been in a situation where you were ready to beg God, to plead with God to do something for yourself, maybe for a family member, maybe for a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker? Have you been in a place where you were ready to lose all respectability to get your request before God. That's the situation of our scripture reading today. This is a scripture that Martin Luther always found great comfort in. It was a scripture that is, as he read, he, he would remark that even this Gentile woman discovered the faithfulness of Jesus. Part of what it can mean to be a human being is to recognize the limits of our influence and our power, the limits of our ability to control our world, to shape it according to our will. A few weeks ago, 
uh, Scott Cormode was uh, preaching, and he was talking about a transformation in prayer. And if you recall, he talked about getting to that place in prayer around certain things where you're saying to God, God, I can't control this. If I could, I wouldn't be handing it over to you. You remember that? If you were here, you remember that? If I could control this, I would not be handing it over to you. It's that place where you lose all respectability. You're willing to lose all respectability because something matters to you so much. Something, something means so much to you, and you recognize that in this place you are powerless. Absolutely powerless. And so it's precisely in those places so often that we find ourselves willing to beg God to do something. This is our story this morning. This woman comes to Jesus ready to beg Jesus to help her daughter. Now it's worth stepping back and seeing how this story develops. Last week we were also in the seventh chapter of Mark and Jesus was trying to teach uh, some of his disciples, trying to teach teach some of his fellow Jews, trying to lead them into the kingdom of heaven, trying to show them what it was to follow God. And and he had the Pharisees and the scribes, they came to him and they were opposing him and he was getting flustered at his inability to get through to them. And our reading today picks up where Jesus left sort of purposefully. You can imagine Jesus saying, I need a break from these people. We also all know what it's like to need a break. Anybody ever been in that place? (laughs) Whatever it is. Sometimes it is I need a break from that person, right? Oh, come on. There's a face that just came to mind for everybody. You're like, oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes you just need a break from situations, but sometimes we need a break from some people, and that's the situation that Jesus found himself in. And so he gets up, he purposefully leaves, and he goes to the region of Tyre. Now, Tyre was a place where you would not expect Jesus to go. This was like Jesus going to the very enemies of the Jewish people. James Edwards, in his commentary on the Gospel of Mark, says this, that the historian Josephus concluded that the inhabitants of Tyre were, and I quote, notoriously our bitterest enemies. That's who Jesus chose to go see. Jesus went to the territory of the bitterest enemies of the Jewish people. And you can almost imagine Jesus saying, I got to get somewhere where these people are not going to follow me. And so he goes to the region of Tyre. He gets in a house and the very beginning of our reading tells us Jesus was basically trying to hide. He was like, I need a break. I want to just disappear for a little while. But he wasn't able to. Jesus wanted to just get a break from these people who were just never getting it, but he wasn't able to because, in fact, a woman whose young daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard about him right away. I wonder how that news traveled. I find that to be a curious part of our story. I mean, there are only two options here, really. One is Jesus went to this region of his bitterest enemies, and he found some uh, Jewish person living there, and he thought, hey, can I bunk with you for a while? I got to get away, right? And maybe a Jewish person living in Tyre would be the kind of Jewish person who would think, oh, I know what you mean. (laughs) Yeah, like I'm here because I had to get away. I mean, that's one possibility. And so maybe this Jewish host was, was around in the market or something started spreading. Oh, I've got a house guest. His name's Jesus. And people started to go, oh, I've heard rumors. I mean, that's one possibility. The other possibility is Jesus went to Tyre and decided, I'm just going to stay with some random person. They don't even have to be Jewish. I don't even care right now. I so have to get away, I so need a break that it does not matter. So maybe Jesus was staying with some Gentiles. 
and maybe news about him was traveling that way. It, it doesn't really matter. We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. It only tells us this, that as soon as this woman found out, she went and begged for Jesus to heal her daughter. Jesus, you got to do something. I'm at the end of my power. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm at the end of my influence. I've done everything I can think of to do. You got to do something for my daughter. It's such a touching scene. This woman begging Jesus to do something. And then we get Jesus' response, which is, let's face it, pretty jarring, isn't it? I mean, this becomes one of those scriptures where we have to wrestle because it's not the Jesus we would imagine. I mean, if I were to tell you, once upon a time in the Bible, there was a story where a woman came and, and she begged to Jesus for the sake of her daughter, how do you imagine Jesus would respond like, tell me how that story goes. This is not what you'd come up with. Right? This is not, you wouldn't be like, well, I bet Jesus would probably like sort of refer to her as a dog. What? That's, that's not what we expect. And so it's important, I think, when we find these stories that are jarring, that we take the time to dig and to find out what's going on. This woman came to Jesus, and she begged and pleaded for the sake of her daughter. Mark goes out of his way to step back and tell us that this woman was Greek Syrophoenician by birth. Keep in mind all the different things that this means about this woman as she begs. It's a woman... She's a Gentile. Not only is she a Gentile, but she's, she is Syrophoenician. She's among the bitterest enemies of the Jewish people. I mean, you can almost imagine, like, it's a woman, one strike. She's Greek, two strikes. Right? She, she's Syrophoenician. She's among our bitterest enemies, three strikes. You can imagine any good Jewish person seeing this encounter going, three strikes, she's out. But that's, there's nothing else to even say here. She's done. There's no way Jesus is going to do anything for this woman. But instead, Jesus engages her. Jesus says to her, the children have to be fed first. It isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. The children have to be fed first. It isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. It's a harsh statement, but it's important to see what's happening here because in the Greek, there is a bit of the edge in this story that is, that is taken away. See, it's not a compliment to call somebody a dog. We all know this, right? When I lived in Oklahoma, there was a story, you know, sometimes newspapers will write up, like, things from the past that sort of blow your mind. You ever read those articles? It's just like, hey, this happened one time. Well, it was a story about a time in Kansas where two guys were in a street, and one of the guys shot and killed the other guy and was dragged off to court. And when he was in court, he said, it's justifiable homicide. And the judge said, why are you saying that? And the guy said, because he called me a son of a dog. And the judge said, you're right. Justifiable homicide. Like, there are things you don't say to people. It's not a compliment to be called a dog. In Greek, though, there, there's a word for dog that, that might be used of a street mongrel, a sort of ratty dog that's roaming and wild, and that's not the word that Jesus uses. Instead, he uses a diminutive form of the word that has the image of a small dog that might be kept in a house that people would throw food to when they were done eating. Now, here's a meal back in Jesus' day. People don't have forks and silverware. And so often, they're eating with their hands, maybe eating with bread, and it would be accustomed to sometimes in the midst of eating to take the bread and to throw it to the dogs who were roaming under the table. 
This is the image that Jesus sets up. And notice what he says. He doesn't say the dogs shouldn't ever eat, but he says, first, let the children eat. First, let the children eat. See, Jesus is giving this woman a parable and inviting her to see something about his own sense of mission and purpose. Jesus is trying to say something, inviting her into a parable about his own role within God's mission to the Jewish people and then also through the Jewish people to the broader world. It's not right to take the children's bread and and give it to the dogs, so first let the children eat. It's still got a sting to it, I mean, let's be honest, I wouldn't want Jesus to say this to me. I doubt you would either. Yes? It's like maybe a parable, but not a parable that we would like to have directed at us. But here's the remarkable thing. Something amazing happens. Something more amazing than this woman coming and begging at Jesus' feet. The amazing thing is this. For the first time, she enters into the parable that Jesus has spoken. She places herself in the parable. She allows the parable to read her, and she responds to Jesus from within it. Now, that that doesn't happen. It's remarkable. This woman's amazing. (laughs) This woman is absolutely amazing. Jesus is trying to teach people. He's using parables, and people are so thick, his disciples are so thick, that they never get it. Ever. Because they never enter into the parable. They're always so busy trying to make things literal. They're like, Jesus, what do you mean? How in the world could I possibly be born again? Or Jesus, what do you mean, watch out for the yeast? Right? I mean, you see, everybody's missing it, but in this encounter, something amazing takes place because the woman hears this parable and she responds to Jesus. And here's what she says, Lord, even the dogs eat the table, or even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Do you see the remarkableness of her answer? That she takes on the parable, she allows the parable to identify her, to read her, and she responds from within it, and she does something amazing and subtle. See, when Jesus, in his first parable, talks about the children, he uses the Greek word technon, and it has this sense of uh, familial relations. I mean, these are like your kids, (laughs) These are like your kids. But here's the amazing thing. When the woman responds back to Jesus, identifying the parable, taking the parable on, she says, yes, Lord, but even the children, and she changes the word, it's pedion, and it has a broader sense. This is like, yeah, your children, but also like maybe in Jesus' day, the, the servant's children, or the housekeeper's children, or the gardener's children. I mean, it's got this broader, more encompassing sense. And so she does this amazing thing. She identifies in the parable, she hears the parable, she lets it read her, but then she lays claim in a broader sense to Jesus' love. And I find the way that the Common English Bible captures Jesus' response to be just perfect. Good answer! <laughs> Like, well done! Like, I haven't seen this in all of Israel. Serious. I mean, I, I bet Jesus is like, huh, like, go get all the Pharisees and like, let's introduce them to this woman. Because she just got it. Like, wow! Good answer. I imagine Jesus, who had been trying to hide, trying to get away, was suddenly reinvigorated for ministry. <laughs> Like, it's all worth it now. I bet he wanted to pull that one and say, you just made my day. You might have just made my three years. What, I mean, Jesus is so excited by her response. 
and tells her, good answer. I mean, you've so allowed that answer that receive my love. Go home. Head on out. Your daughter's fine. It's a beautiful story about a person who receives an encounter with Jesus, who hears a parable and allows the parable to read her, who enters into the parable and and allows the parable to shape the way she sees herself and the world around her and her role in it. And all the while, she lays claim to the love of God. I mentioned James Edwards in his commentary earlier, and, and in his commentary, he talks about this woman. He says, in the New Testament, she is like the female Jacob who wrestles with God who wrestles with Jesus and is victorious for a blessing. I think this has bearing for all of us as we find ourselves in those places in our lives where we are begging God to move. And isn't it just so true that so often in the midst of our begging and our pleading, When we go to the scriptures, it can so often seem like we just don't get the kind of response that we would have hoped for. The kind of response that we would have liked to hear initially. Anybody been there? I know I have. The times where you go to the scriptures and you're crying out and it almost seems at best, so irrelevant that you think, what's the point? And at worst, it can seem like, now that's just mean. Like in the midst of this moment, like I would not say that to a friend. You ever been in that place? You're like, that's not the response I would give. And this woman encounters exactly that kind of moment in her pleading, but she does something remarkable. Instead of pushing Jesus' response away, instead of just closing his response, instead of just going home and saying, how dare he? Instead, she lays hold of Jesus' words and enters into a wrestling, holding fast to her confidence in Jesus' love while at the same time allowing the complexity of the parable, the story, to read and identify her. Friends, my hope, my prayer for all of us is that we would receive from this most unlikely place, this Greek Syro-Phoenician woman, a great example of faithfulness and that we would imitate her in our own struggling when we're crying out and pleading with God, that we would be willing to follow her example and enter into a struggle for the sake of a blessing of Jesus' love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for confession, especially after that moving sermon. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Now please take a moment for your own personal confession. Lord, remind us of your mercy. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now hear this good news in the assurance of pardon. Beloved of God, hear the good news. 
Who in all creation is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, and a new life in God has begun. Remember the promise of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit in your baptism, and know that in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. It's a precious gift. Let all God's children say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. As we enter into a time of praise, please enter into it yourself and uh, hum along if, uh, if you are so moved.
In the Gospels, whenever Jesus sat at table, he was always a guest. Here at this table, Christ is host. So come, sinners and saints, all you who hunger for a deeper faith, all you who thirst for a God-filled life, all you who look for a more righteous world, Jesus bids you come. He is the first fruit of God's new creation, God's seed that seals the promise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joy we praise you, gracious God. You created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. You love the world so much, Almighty God, that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. He lived as one of us, proclaiming the good news of your salvation. Glory to you, Lord Jesus. We remember with thanksgiving our Lord's meal with his disciples, in which he took the bread and blessed it, broke it open and gave it to them, saying, This is my body. Take and eat it, remembering me. We remember how he took a cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, Jesus Christ is the true bread from heaven who gave his life for the life of the world. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And when we give thanks over the cup, Is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Beloved of God, these are holy gifts for holy people. Yet who is holy? Come then, in Jesus Christ, everything is made ready. I invite you at this time to take your communion cup and to open the bread side and to take the bread when you are ready as a sign of your individual faith in Christ. And then I invite you to open the cup side and to hold it and we will take it together as a sign of our unity in Christ. The blood of Christ shed for the redemption of all creation. Let us pray. 
Lord, you have put gladness in our hearts, and you have satisfied our hunger with good things. In giving all, you have not withheld from us even your own dear Son. How can we, O Lord, withhold anything from you? Renew us day by day with the gift of your Spirit, that we may give ourselves completely to your service and walk with joy in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. At this time, I want to invite uh, Bill Corret to come up to give uh, an announcement from the Laird Hall Task Force. Um, good answer. <laughs> it has been a while since you've heard from the Laird Hall Task Force, but we've still been at work and have not ceased, even during the period of time when COVID made the world stand still, we were Zooming. Today, and for the next three Sundays, the work we have completed to date will be on display in the front of the church. We've taken all the input from the congregational surveys completed in February 2020, and come up with plans for you to see outside. Please take the time to carefully explore the plans, the 3D drawings, in order to formulate comments, suggestions, and questions about the design components. If you find floor plans, elevation plans, and site plans confusing, the Laird Hall Task Force members, Don Ebersall, um, Keith Lentz, uh, uh, she uh, Sheila Nash and Terry Nash and myself and Monica Cadwallader will be outside available to support you in your exploration and to orientate you to some of the drawings. On Saturday, a uh, correction, on Sunday, September 19th, we will hold a town hall meeting to get your input into design plans um, so the task force can make final revisions before beginning the construction drawings. Our architect, Ernie Benavides, will be here for that town hall meeting to address any questions you may have about the design components and the thinking that went into it. Also at the September 19th town hall meeting, we will introduce the process by which we will seek your input on how this project will better allow us to live into our mission statement, to follow Jesus, grow together, and share God's love with neighbors near and far. Please mark your calendar for the town hall meeting on Sunday, September 19th, following our regular church service. Your participation is very important to the process. On behalf of the Laird Hall Task Force, we'd like to thank you for getting involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've been having some conversations uh, with some of our teachers as we pray for them and encourage them. And this morning we have uh, Brian Mahaffey. So Brian, I want to invite you to come on up. There you are. Okay. And uh, I'll just ask you a few questions and we'll have a conversation. So first off, um, what inspired you to teach? How long have you been teaching? What do you teach? Well, good morning, everybody, first of all. Um, I am a middle school math teacher, so I'm, yeah. <laughs> um, I've been doing that for 22 years, and, oh, thank you. And I, I chose to become a teacher because you can make a difference. And I had so many important people in my life who, at this key age, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, were there for me and made sure that you know, this is what your path should look like. This is how you can say, stay on the straight path and be positive. And gosh, every day is a challenge. So every morning when I wake up, I don't know what's waiting for me. And as I'm getting older, I'm, I need that more. That's what keeps me going. So, 
you know, waking up and saying, what does the Lord have in store for me today? How can I make a difference in someone's life? That's what I look forward to doing. Okay. And as you think about uh, this upcoming year that is now started, um, what are you excited about? And in what ways can we be praying for you? Yeah, I was, I was thinking about this, and the biggest challenge is um, I have been out of the classroom doing different things for about three years, and last year I made the decision to get back. I, I miss being with kids, and I spent the entire year doing distance learning. And so see, going through that and seeing what families have gone through and... You know, the, the first day where I got to see my kids in person was the last day of school. And I could not wait to get back this year. And so it's doing everything I can to keep things safe and positive for our kids. I've been back for a month now. And like I said, every day is a challenge. We're, we're, we're making it, we're doing the best we can, um, but patience is the number one thing I would pray for. <laughs> from everyone involved, uh, people making decisions about education, teachers themselves. Um, I am dealing with things every day that I'm, I'm gonna be absolutely honest, as a teacher, I'm not completely prepared for. I don't have the training in some of the things I'm dealing with, the mental health issues I'm seeing, the social emotional learning I have to deal with. I got my math down, but the, I'm trying to get everyone the help they need so it's being patient and knowing i'm i'm gonna see what our, our our kids need let's steer them in the right direction make sure they get the help they need make sure parents know we're doing the best we can but it's it's being patient because every time we make a little step forward something happens and it takes us a little bit we're trying to get there and so that's what i would appreciate just praying for patience and wisdom in the decisions we're making okay absolutely here is a, a small gift from us for you. Thank you. Um, and at this time, as we've been doing, I want to invite the elders who were on session to come forward, and we're going to pray for Brian. Um, as we've been doing, because of the pandemic, we're not going to uh, place our hands on Brian, but we'll at least surround him uh, with our love and our prayers. And congregation, I invite you to join in the prayer. It'll be coming up on the screen here uh, as we pray for Brian. Let us uh, join together. O oh Lord, you who have called and equipped the teachers in our community, we pray for them today, especially Brian. Watch over them, provide for them, guide them, sustain them. May you be their sun and shield so that they might do the work that you have entrusted to them and sense your care in these uncertain times. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Brian. And now, congregation, as you are able, I invite you to stand. As we prepare to transition now from this time of worship together, to the worship that we will live throughout this week, I invite you to take a moment and to look ahead and see the places where you will be this coming week. Who are the people you are going to be meeting with? What are the conversations you know you'll be having? What meetings await you? What errands do you have to run? It's in those places precisely that God calls us and equips us to live out our ministry of reconciliation. And so let us join in our prayer of reconciliation together. Please pray with me. Holy God, you created all people in your image. I thank you for the astonishing variety of races and cultures and peoples in this world. Enrich my life by ever-widening circles of friendship and show me your presence in those who differ most from me until my knowledge of your love 
is made perfect in my love for all your children. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. And friends, as you go now, receive the blessing. May the triune God go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you in obedient ministry, above you to watch over you, beneath you to uphold you, within you to give you faith, hope, and love, and before you to show you the way. And let all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen. Thank you.